Defence Dialogue, a podcast discussing contemporary challenges in the area of European security and defence. Brought to you by the Martin Centre with Nicholas Novaki. Welcome to Defence Dialogue, a podcast series by the Wilfrid Martin Centre for European Studies, which uh, discusses contemporary issues and challenges in the area of European defence. I am uh, Dr. Nicholas Novaki, and today we are talking to Professor Jolien Holworth, who is a John Monet Professor of European Politics and Emeritus Professor of European Studies at the University of Bath, and also a visiting Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at Yale University. Professor Holworth has literally written the book on EU defence, which is titled Security and Defence Policy in the European Union, which is currently in its uh, second edition. In addition, he has published numerous other publications on EU defence cooperation, including a paper titled For a True European Defence Union, published with the Martin Centre in December 2017. Professor Holworth, welcome to Defence Dialogue. Delighted to be here. Your background is slightly unusual compared to many other analysts and experts of EU defence cooperation because you started in uh, French studies and, and history and then only later on you moved to study European defence. What made you switch from these topics into European defence? I was initially a historian of 19th century France and I wound up doing my dissertation on the key character in the bringing about of socialist unity in France in 1905. The socialist, the left in France has only ever been unified between 1905 and 1920, it's the only period in its history. And uh, my main character, a man called Edouard Vaillant, who had been a member of the Paris Commune, was instrumental in creating socialist unity, but he also spent the last 15 years of his life trying to prevent World War I, and I edited his correspondence with the International Socialist Bureau, which was about how one could put an end to international wars, uh, which got me really interested in all of this. This was at the time when the Vietnam War was in full swing. I was very active. I was living in Paris, lived in Paris for 10 years, between 68 and 78. I was very active and uh, decided that international relations is actually much more relevant to my life than history, so I switched. And obviously uh, French studies and uh, knowing France extremely well in the area of European defence is, is obviously a huge uh, advantage because France uh, being a country that has a very significant role to play in uh, EU defence cooperation even now. Yeah, I was. it was through my, my specialisation in French defence policy that I gradually became a specialist in European because they are, for the French at any rate, the same thing. I ah, see. <laughs> And uh, nowadays, you often hear in Brussels when you go to different events and, and, and uh, you read uh, different publications that more has been achieved in the area of European defence in the past couple of years than in fact was achieved in the previous 60. Is this also a view uh, that you as an academic expert of EU defence cooperation uh, share? No, I really don't. I think one of the big problems in this city in particular is a lack of institutional memory. And one of the things that strikes me very, very strongly when reading these new pronouncements on the revitalised European security and defence policy project, etc., is that we've read all of this before. I mean, this really just echoes discussions we had the late 90s, the early 2000s, and all the way through the first decade of the 21st century. So there's nothing particularly new in the, in the, in the sorts of things that people are talking about. There is a new context. We are in a much more urgent geostrategic situation, a more dramatic geostrategic situation than we were at the turn of the century. Um, and things are happening, there's no question, but one needs to keep uh, all of this in perspective and understand that there is nothing particularly new about what's happening, it's just the power behind it and the dynamic behind it. That, that, that be the case, but there does seem to be this genuinely new momentum to deepen EU defence cooperation and we've seen this with uh, the creation of the uh, European Defence Fund, uh, establishment of permanent structured cooperation, establishment of this embryonic EU military headquarters, the military planning and conduct capability and the EU military staff. Is this still like that? Isn't this still genuinely a little bit different to what we've uh, seen before? Well, the what's different about it is the uh, is the impulse behind it. I mean, we were talking about OHQ a long time ago. We've been talking about funding defence in various ways. PESCO has been around for 10 years. What's new is the, the drive behind it, and the drive is fueled, to my 
mind essentially by the geostrategic situation we're in, which is very, very different. Now, there is a build-up of momentum, yes, there's a build-up of steam, but one must not assume that we haven't been here before. One thing that is often discussed also in Brussels nowadays, when new documents about defense cooperation are being published, when key officials make statements, is this issue of a European Security and Defense Union. And in fact, this is also a subject that your recent publication with the Martin Center addresses. However, in the European Union itself doesn't have a clear definition yet of what a Security and Defense Union would mean. What, in your opinion, such a security and defense union means in practice? Well, I think it's actually b bouncing off the notion of the European Union, which was itself uh, an invention back in the day. Um, you know, we've tried various acronyms for this project, C ESDP, CESDP, CSDP, acronym SOUP, if you like, and European Defense Union sounds about right. So I don't think it's much more than that. What we are seeing in Europe increasingly now is pleas or projects in various policy areas for a differentiated Europe where overlapping policy areas will contain different member states. I think the, the, the fundamental principle behind the European Defence Union is that defence and security are indivisible and that this is something that everybody has to be in together because otherwise we all hang, se hang separately. So I think it's a convenient and a very useful way of differentiating what's happening now, the European Defence Union, if that's what we're going to call it, from you know, the former projects for CSDP, etc. Is it simply another name to describe deeper EU defence cooperation? Yes, it, it, it is, has an emphasis on deeper defence cooperation. I mean, the, the first time the phrase was coined was back at the Chocolate Summit in 2003, when you know, it was all about differentiating between those who were serious about Europe uh, and those who were not in the context of the Iraq uh, invasion. But it's a, it's a phrase which sort of lost focus because it was very controversial and now it's no longer controversial to use the phrase, I think. Another term that is often nowadays thrown frequently in, in various events in Brussels and in, in different documents is this notion of uh, strategic autonomy, which, which was first introduced in the 2016 EU Global Strategy. However, there wasn't a very clear definition of what, a stra what strategic autonomy would mean in practice. What, in your opinion, does strategic autonomy for the European Union uh, mean? It means something very, very simple in the first instance. It means that Europe would no longer be totally dependent or even partially dependent on its security for the United States. The notion was first launched actually in the San Malo Declaration in 1998 when we talked about the necessity for autonomous capacity, which essentially meant that if Europe is going to be responsible for the stabilization, the, secure, the securitization, or securization, whichever is the word, uh, of its neighborhood, then it had to do it, be able to do it on its own. Now I think the concept as it was relaunched in the global strategy is emphasizing the point that at the end of the day Europe has to become self-reliant and self-sufficient. There is no God-given reason why Europe should forever be dependent on the United States for its security and, and defense. It is bigger in terms of population, it has a bigger GDP now, it has equal scientific and technological abilities, it has everything really that the United States has and there is from the perspective of the American taxpayer absolutely no reason why the Americans should continue indefinitely to offer Europe this sort of uh, blank check for its security. So I think that the principle, and I believe in it strongly myself, I advocate it, and I'm strongly in favour of it, the principle that Europe should give itself or set itself the objective of becoming self-reliant and independent is not a way of saying we want to break with the Americans or break up the Atlantic Alliance or anything like that. It is actually going back to the fundamental principles of NATO when NATO was founded. NATO was only founded in 1949 to give the Europeans a breathing space while they recovered from the war and got themselves organized so that they could offer a firm resistance to uh, what 
you know, percent was potentially perceived as a, a threat from the Soviet Union and the Red Army. That didn't happen because of all sorts of reasons, but General Eisenhower, when he took over NATO in 1951, I think, when he became Supreme Allied Commander, said if NATO is still needed in 10 years' time, it will have failed in its mission. Which means, essentially, that the whole purpose of this was to render the Europeans capable of looking after themselves. I think that's a perfectly valid and, indeed, a logical objective, and that's where we should be heading. And I think we should, it's, I think it's correct to state that as an objective up front. How we get there is what we're talking about. There are, however, some concerns among certainly EU member states and, and especially in Washington that by putting emphasis on uh, strategic autonomy, the European Union and some member states are seeking to distance themselves from the transatlantic alliance with the United States. And uh, also in your paper uh, for a true European Defence Union, you mentioned that in order to achieve true strategic autonomy, the EU's Common Security and Defence Policy, or CSDP, should eventually be merged uh, with NATO. My question is, is it really necessary for there to be such a merger of CSDP and NATO in order for the European Union to become uh, truly strategic autonomous? Well, the answer to that is, is complicated. It comes in several stages. First of all, and you asked actually several questions <laughs> that certain Central and Eastern European countries may be a bit, little bit nervous about this is obviously a reflection of their geostrategic situation and their history of the Soviet Union. One can fully understand that these countries as they emerge out, out of the totalitarian nightmare of the Cold War will give priority in their own strategic thinking to the relationship with America, with NATO, etc. And the European Union is almost a secondary uh, objective at that point. Uh, we, we fully understand that, but that isn't the end of the story. If Americans think that the European Security and Defence Policy Project, European Defence Union, whatever you call it, is in some way a balancing against America, which is the uh, dominant theme among American international relations specialists, all I can say is that they are wrong. This is not in any way an attempt to balance against America, it is to try to do what the Americans have been encouraging the Europeans to do for the last 40 or 50 years, which is to build up their own capacity to create, if you like, two solid pillars. The idea of the two pillars has been around for 50 years within the Atlantic Alliance so that it isn't so unbalanced. The project is to create more balance to redistribute the roles of leadership and responsibility within the Alliance without breaking it up. Now, my thinking on that is that at the end of the day, when assuming, and I, you know, I'm agnostic on whether the EU will actually get there, but assuming it achieves what it has set for itself as the objective of strategic autonomy, this will mean that within NATO there is equality of capacity and so on, the Europeans will be in a position to look after their own neighbourhood without having to be dependent, I'm saying reliant, but dependent on the United States. At that point, we can sign a new treaty with the United States because I believe, and this is at the centre of my thoughts on all of this, that Europeans and Americans share with each other more than either shares with any other part of the world. So we do have a community of values, a community of interests, a community of norms. And we should not be afraid of saying that within that community of norms, there should be rough equivalence between the two sides so that the Americans can get on and prioritize the strategic areas of the world where they have real focus and leave the Europeans to take care of their neighborhood. That's not breaking up the alliance, it's recreating the alliance on a much stronger basis. Continuing with the theme of American views on EU defense cooperation, US officials such as uh, NATO Ambassador Kate Bailey Hutchinson have recently begun to express concerns specifically about permanent structured cooperation, PESCO, because they apparently see it as, as a protectionist vehicle to, to close uh, European defence markets for American defence companies. To what extent, in your opinion, uh, these are valid concerns? Well, there's always been an element of mutual schizophrenia in this relationship. Ever since the end of the Cold War, when Americans were urging the Europeans to get their act together and to become competent and capable in their neighbourhood, there was this sense that, uh, from the American perspective, yes, we would like the American, we would like the Europeans to be more competent, but we don't want them 
running away. And from the European perspective, yes, we would like to be less dependent on the United States, but we want to, don't want to chase them away. So there's this mutual schizophrenia. Now, uh, when this was first set up, in 90, after the uh, San Malo Declaration in 1998, the immediate American reaction was, oh my goodness, no decoupling, no discrimination, and no duplication. So these were the American prescription, you may do this thing, but on our conditions, which was um, unacceptable from the European perspective. The Americans then realized with the Afghan situation and the Iraq situation that they didn't have unlimited capacity, and it would be a very good thing if the Europeans were able to develop their own capacity. Uh, and so we've blown hot and cold on this. Uh, first of all, it was no, then it was yes, we encourage you. And now with Trump back in office, there is this renewed sense that, oh dear, the Europeans are getting out of hand. I think that for Americans to accuse the Europeans of protectionism is a little bit like the pot calling the kettle black because certainly entry into the American defense market is much more difficult for Europeans than vice versa. So I see this as a storm in a teacup. I don't think that it's serious at all. I actually don't think that PESCO, as it is currently configured, is going to necessarily revolutionize the situation, but you know, we'll see how that develops. What are your reservations about PESCO? Basically that it seems to have contravened the spirit in which it was initially conceived, because in the treaty, and we're talking about Lisbon now, so we're going back 10 years more, the idea was to have those with superior capability or advanced capability who were wanting, wanting to get involved in the most difficult missions and whatnot, getting together as a vanguard. So after the Lisbon Treaty, there was a long discussion about whether we're talking about including eight, nine, ten, or a dozen member states, or whether we're including everybody. That discussion about inclusion, exclusion dominated the conversation about PESCO for a number of years. It remained unresolved, and so PESCO was left hanging out to dry. Now we've reinvented PESCO, or resuscitated it, or given it a kick start, we had to do something. And I think what happened was that Inevitably, in the absence of the United Kingdom Brexit, it had to be a Franco-German initiative, it was a Franco-German initiative, and from the outset, it was a fairly ambitious initiative. We then get into the business of how far does this ambition go and how many countries do we involve. The French position on this was very clear from the outset. Eight, nine, ten, twelve maximum countries should be with the ones with higher criteria and higher ability and prepared to engage in the most demanding missions, the German position was always for a variety of reasons. Partly, I suspect, because Germany didn't want to be too dominated by France in this context, partly because Germany always has a Europeanist discourse, and partly also, this may sound contradictory, but it isn't, because the German Defense Ministry and the Bundeswehr are very concerned to build up a European pillar within NATO. So for all those reasons, Germany wanted to include as many countries as possible, and we've seen that has been what has happened. So the German vision of PESCO has won out over the French vision, which in part I think also explains why the French have gone off to do the European Intervention Initiative as a separate or a parallel exercise. So I, I worry, frankly, that PESCO has become so all-inclusive and so sort of diffuse that we've lost the concentration which is necessary for it to be successful. One of the main reasons that enabled PESCO to be established when it was last year, in my opinion, was the fact that the United Kingdom is now leaving the European Union. Traditionally, the United Kingdom has been one of the most Atlanticist uh, member states in the Union, prioritizing cooperation with NATO and the United States in the area of defense over cooperation uh, with, with the EU in the area of defense, even though it is one of the countries in addition to France that uh, set up the whole thing in 1998. But my question is, how will Brexit, in your opinion, uh, affect the future of EU defense cooperation, given also the fact that the United Kingdom is, is uh, by far one of the most capable EU member states currently, militarily? Well, we're in a very paradoxical situation here. As you say, the UK was instrumental along with France at Saint-Malo, and Saint-Malo is really the reference point, December 1998, in setting this whole thing up. But France and the UK set it up for diametrically opposite reasons. France set it up because it genuinely believed in this European project, which was being done for European reasons, uh, with a European perspective and a European objective. 
the British who did it because the message from Washington was always, unless Europe gets its act together, NATO is dead in the water. So the, Europe, the British are doing this in order to save NATO from its own fate. That's the contradiction and the paradox from the outset. Having said that, the British were very, very instrumental in put, putting together most of the food for thought papers at the beginning of this to get it on the rails. And then, of course, with the Iraq war, the British sort of drift off and prioritize a relationship with the United States. And ever since then, Britain has acted as a break. So one can fully understand that when Brexit happens and the Brits pull out, a lot of people in Europe think, whew, at last we can now, you know, make something of it without this, uh, without this British uh, opposition. I think that's probably too simplistic a, a reaction. The idea that Brexit would lead to the disintegration of the European Union, which was also around at the same time, I think is completely misguided. Uh, my sense is that most uh, all other European countries looking at the mess that Brexit has become have decided that consolidation of Europe is the name of the game. So now, to get back to the defence perspective, it is just a fact that the UK is one of the two really competent global players, certainly regional players, and that the loss of the UK is a significant and a serious loss to European capacity. So starting from that principle, I think that it is in the interests of the European Union to try to minimise the damage of the loss of the UK, and my sense is that the EU is very keen to engage in very serious discussions about a new arrangement between the European Defence Union or CSDP or whatever you call it and the UK. I think that the UK is equally uh, keen to remain fully engaged in European security and defence even though it has always had this NATO-centric, US-oriented thrust to it. So there's a bit of a contradiction there, and I think if the EU is to follow what I, my prescription, and instead of trying to identify things to do which are different from what NATO is doing, it accepts that it would make more sense to progressively merge its activities with NATO, EU-NATO cooperation, then the UK can play an important role there. It will be an ambivalent role, and there will be many in the UK who will be tempted in that context to say, OK, this is the opportunity to prioritise NATO, come what may, and to preserve American leadership and so on and so forth, which is the opposite of what I'm saying. And I think it's the opposite of what the Americans are saying, actually. The British are outliers here. I have a British accent, I have a British passport, but I do not speak as a typical Brit. And I think it's important for people to understand that. Uh, so don't get my message wrong. I think it's going to be very complicated. The most complicated issue is going to be the legal situation. Because I think the EU has always taken the view that if you're out, then you're out, and you cannot be part of the EU conversation. I actually think that that was a mistake we made when we set up CSDP back in 1998-1999 because it had implications for Turkey and Norway, which are very important players in the regional security picture. Uh, we should have found a legal uh, loophole or a legal way of involving those countries which are NATO members but not EU members in the way in which they were involved in the former Western European Union. We didn't do that. We said, you're excluded, the neutrals are in, and that's the end of the story. We should not repeat that mistake now because it is important to find some way of involving the UK in a way which will not allow the UK to deviate the course that the new Europe may be setting itself, but which will allow the UK to play an important part in that course. Staying with the theme of the, the legal aspect of CSDP and the UK's future involvement in it, the former British Foreign Secretary William Hague suggested a while ago that it would be extremely beneficial if the United Kingdom could have an observer status in the EU's political and security committee after Brexit. In your opinion, would this be legally possible uh, to arrange in the with the current treaties, I'll offer it. The law is what the politicians decide it should be. And as I say, the legal objections to involving Turkey and Norway in ways in which they had previously been involved in the Western European Union was decisive and they were just kept out. I think, yes, I think that it would be both appropriate and uh, necessary in some way to associate the UK with 
discussions in the Political and Security Committee and indeed in the European Union Military Committee and, and, and even staff, those, those institutions which were established for this purpose. I can fully understand European nervousness about bringing the Brits back in to that process when they have played such a negative role in that process hitherto. But I also think, and this is a rather separate um, observation, I also think that it is becoming clear to the British that Brexit is infinitely more complicated than they thought. I mean, they didn't really have any clear idea of what it involved anyway, and I don't think most of them thought it was going to happen. But they are now experiencing the difficulties in withdrawing from any of this, and they're experiencing uh, a recognition that life is... I, I, my own sense is that it is becoming clear to Brits that life is going to be much more difficult after Brexit. They're also going to discover in this particular field of defence and security that the United States has far less interest in the UK than it did when the UK was a full member of the European Union. I mean, for a long time, the United States have been saying to Britain, this has been the dominant discourse from Washington to London, stay in Europe, lead Europe, get serious about Europe, get your act together with Europe, and play a leading role in Europe. Now, that's going to be much more difficult for the Brits to do, and for that reason, Britain is going to be far less interesting for the Americans. So the Brits are, in a sense, between a rock and a hard place. Their ultimate historical future, to my mind, is with Europe. That's where they live. <laughs> that's where they are geographically. And as the world goes through a process of power transition, uh, that is going to be uh, Britain's foremost role. I, I believe that fundamentally. I would even go so far as to say that while I wouldn't go so far as to say that Brexit was a good thing, but if you're looking for light at the end of the tunnel, it may be a good thing for the British to spend 20, 30 years of damp isolation in the middle of the North Sea, unloved by everybody, which would finally make them understand who they are, because they have never answered that question since the end of World War II. Who are we? They think that they are both an island and a global power. They are both European and American, and they need to decide this. Uh, this is the moment, I think, for the Brits to decide, and I hope that they will decide that they are European. Just lastly, and related to that hopeful note, this year will mark the 20th anniversary of the Franco-British uh, St. Marlowe Declaration, which, which was uh, announced in uh, December 1998 by the heads of state of uh, France and, and Britain. A lot has been achieved in the area of European defence uh, since uh, the St. Marlowe Declaration, but equally a lot of work also remains to be done. In your opinion, where would you like to see EU defence to be after the next 20 years? I would like it to be strategically autonomous, which means that uh, perhaps for uh, next, you say next 20 years, that takes us what to 38. Well, this is a long way. <laughs> I would hope that by 2029, which is the 80th anniversary of the NATO treaty, the European Union was getting close to a position of strategic autonomy. Now, that is just a, 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 you know an umbrella objective. If things go the way I am prescribing, and I personally am not totally convinced they will, but I think that this is the only way we're going to get there. I don't think we're going to get there by identifying CSDP or the European Defence Union as something distinct from and different from NATO, because at the end of the day, regional security and defence is indivisible. It's one thing. We only have one set of resources, both manpower and instruments and whatnot. And instead of having this sort of focus on differentiation and distinctiveness and so on and so forth, I think we should be putting them together. That doesn't mean that this Europeanized NATO, I see that I see the objective that we should set ourselves as the Europeanization of NATO. I come back to this this rebalancing of responsibilities as between Europe and America within the alliance. That doesn't mean that the Europeanized NATO, if we ever get there, will be identical to the American dominated NATO that we know. 
I don't think that in the southern neighborhood the answer is primarily military. You know, the, the, the development of Africa, the Africanization of Africa, the dealing with the migrant flows and everything else that is a challenge from Africa is not primarily a military challenge. I think the deterrence or containment of a resurgent Russia is, is more of a military challenge and that is something which is being addressed in a variety of ways. I mean, the German framework nation concept is another variant on PESCO. We've got all sorts of things going off in that, um, in that region. But we should not see Russia today under Putin as a reincarnation of the Soviet Union under Brezhnev or, or, or anybody else. Europe has a Russia problem. We've had a Russia problem for 300 years, ever since Peter the Great brought Russia into the concept of nations. And the problem remains the same and will be the same, whether it's Putin in charge or Medvedev in charge or Yeltsin or whoever. Uh, the problem is the same. What we have in Europe are resources, skills, uh, assets, etc., which are vastly superior in every single domain to anything that Russia has got, including actually the military. So uh, I, I'm a little bit uh, perplexed as to why the European Union, which as I say is, is a much more impressive entity than this declining power that is Russia, should be caught like a rabbit in the headlights and terrified of everything that, 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 that Moscow does. Uh, say I can understand that from if you're an Estonian or a Lithuanian or even a Finn, <laughs> but um, uh, we have to see it as a as a whole. And so I think that the the Europeanized NATO from a military perspective will be a very different sort of actor than the old deterrent containment NATO for holding back the Soviet Union, if that was what the objective was. Well, we shall have to wait until 2029 to see, I mean, whether in fact we will have such a NATO. But Professor Hogarth, thank you very much for your time and, and uh, thank you very much for, uh, for participating in the Defence Dialogue. Thank you. That was today's episode of Defence Dialogue. Subscribe to our podcasts for more.